the we, we set up our criminal justice system in, in such a stance that we punish people that are not like us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way we punish them is to drive them out of society, whether it's by imprisoning or, or a ritual use of community service, mm -hmm. and miss the fact that actually it might not be a punishment. The idea that I don't want to be like you, actually I totally and radically reject you, and the more you do this, the more I succeed. That would be a... Uh that would be a kind of feedback loop that you might see happening, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over there. Yes, just back to the Chilean project. I mean, when I see the command and control room for that project, mm -hmm. uh, somehow it shows sort of seniority and sort of superiority for those groups who are controlling the entire economy of Chile at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the design of it reflects that. While in VSM, for example, we are talking about uh, the balance between uh, uh, central and this centralization and decentralization. We talk about the synergy between the old five systems, but that the design of that room somehow doesn't reflect the concepts of VSM, in, just at least theoretically. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I think that the pictures mm -hmm. might be a little. If bit, they are right, I don't know. Uh, I think that might be a little misleading because uh -huh. the way that that was to be set up. In the first place, most of the indices that were reported by the factories were the same kind of indices that normal business reporting covers. You know, the order book, um, you know, the, the raw material supply, the you know, accident rates, complaints, all of the sort of standard things, you know, even stuff like cash on hand. So with what the what the design was supposed to do with the recursions was that each factory might have, say, eight, somewhere between eight and 12 indices that would monitor the health and well-being of that factory, <coughs> and it would be autonomous at that point. As soon as one of those indices went out of bounds, there was to be a computer program that would say, is this, is this point a random, event or a transient event or maybe this point is a step change possibility or a slope change possibility so you want to know and you set the thresholds by weighting these indices is when does it look like this level of recursion has lost control of the situation and it needs to get kicked up to the next but with respect to the national level and the president's office sitting around they're not interested in micromanaging. They're interested in which of the industries is having a harder time, which of the industries is growing, and maybe they should help it along a little bit. We did some work in Uruguay, and one of the, one of the things that kind of led to us being brought in under a UNDP project was the fact that the then president, Julio Sanguinetti, was a journalist as well as a lawyer, and he was already monitoring, I think he had eight indices, and the, the main one that enabled him to say that the economy had picked up before the results were in, quote unquote, under the traditional measures, was that there had been a, a big step change in the daily rate of electricity <coughs> usage during the week. And so that indicated to, to him, you know, that businesses were making things. Um, other indices were things like the liters of milk sold, the taxi cab rides purchased, you know, bus tickets, all these things that indicate, uh, you know, a confidence in that are a secondary measure uh, that are comparable to the Kraft Dinner Index, which is again a U.S. example. But Kraft Dinner is boxed macaroni and cheese. It's cheap and it. Had, it can make some pretense to being a proper meal. Not much, but some. And if you see an acceleration in the sales of Kraft Dinner, that is an indication of lack of confidence in the economy. And so there are all these, they call them telltale indices, that you can pick up that a government that is looking ahead uh, might well be monitoring. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, Dennis Van Leusen for IEEE. Um, two things really, and kind of the way the conversation is going. 
One is, I wonder whether your early comments about how staff had started out and the effect of the wartime and the fact that he was, uh, if you like, not allowed to go with the traditional route and he himself uh, came away from that and went his own way. Uh, whether that is important for any thinker who is going to uh, <coughs> book the trend, if you like. The other thing is more pertinent to the recent questions is that you know the, the, the joke about the drunk who's lost his keys mm -hmm. and the policeman asks him is this where he dropped them and he says no but this is where the light is on uh, and I kind of get the feeling that a lot of this stuff on big data and greater use of certain things uh, just makes me feel that the people are just following what they're able to do mm -hmm. not necessarily focusing on the questions to be asked mm -hmm. uh, and they may be doing the wrong things better instead of searching to do the right things right, which I think is something from Jennifer's introduction to her book uh, reflecting the 2000 IWS conference in Toronto. Um, so th those are my thoughts. Well, I cert certainly agree with, with both of those. Um, I think that unless you have some, uh, I suppose, some perception that something isn't fitting the pattern that you, you that you're working with and so how do you deal with an anomaly and if you're in the systems field you think about maybe I need to redraw that boundary maybe I need to look at my assumptions uh, maybe maybe I'm looking at it from the wrong perspective entirely and that, that would lead you to a place where you would say well uh, you know, I, I can't go along with the conventional wisdom because it obviously isn't working. I'd like to just follow on to that because there's a real um, interest and a lot of money being spent, um, I think, just now on urban studies. Mm -hmm. Because urban studies are big in the United States um, and big data is big because they're looking at smart cities and if we could just collect enough data about cities that we could control them, we could predict them, and um, and I have, I, I work at a lab that does a lot of this work, and I have such a problem with it, because they're so enamored with the censoring of cities, but they're not even asking what kind of questions will this even potentially answer. The only good answer I ever got for that was at the Complexity Conference in Santa Fe. Somebody was talking about that if the Internet of Things actually um, extends the human being's senses. In other words, we sense our environment, we move through a city. If having this information gave us the ability to extend our senses mm -hmm. and that we had more information about what was happening with traffic or we had more information about pollution or whatever, that if we could take that into ourselves, that it would have a big impact. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, I just see that people are just, it's gadgets, it's shiny objects and it's really cool big data, but they're not actually thinking about how it would change behaviors or even do anything that would have a positive impact. So. Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of that, that is the case. Although, to some extent, if the big data is linked into something like the traffic lights, it is possible to change the timing of the traffic lights so that traffic flows more smoothly. It is possible to have those, uh, those flashers or or uh, big signs, I suppose, above the highway uh, that say, you know, accident 10 miles ahead. You know, you might want to get off the highway. Uh, but a lot of it also it does help people, you know, to figure out what's, what's going on. One of, the, one of the aspects they were talking about was installing um, little chips in the refrigerator that would sense when your food was going off. You know, Those are problem-driven versus the technology-driven. Yeah. Right? So I think there's just a lot of technology-driven research that, you know, maybe that if we're going to spend our taxpayer dollars in the city, then we'd rather have them tell us this than yeah. just because it's interesting to do this. Um, and so I worry about that. Well, I like what you keep saying, and you've mentioned to me and what Stafford does, is you turn the problem on its side. Yeah. And, you know, I think that if we were to do that more, we'd understand the problem more and not just throw technology at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if you, if, you do, uh, if you do put the environment on top, you know, that reminds you 
that it's what's happening up there that you need to adjust to, not what's happening internally as much. <coughs> it isn't it inevitable if you have a lot of your research people and even university people uh, motivated to make profit that they're going to look to make more use of the technology for that purpose. And, and those purposes you know, oftentimes are going to be narrower than, than the wider issues which are existing. So that I don't think you can you know, get away from the earlier ideological discussion, although I, I wouldn't agree with it in a lot of ways, because I think even in terms of the way people react in the, the legal system, um, or in their responses to failures in education, is that people tend to do what's easy rather than to do what is needed. And it isn't that they don't necessarily grasp what is needed, it's just that it's often harder to do what is needed. And therefore, if you're going to be measured by some very simplistic indicators, you, you, you pick the low, the low yeah. lying fruit that they say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and you know, one has tried through quite a long time, say for example, to address the issue of how the people's criminal careers develop. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's some quite good research on that, and there have been a number of pilot projects, particularly on the west coast of the US, at various levels in people's academic careers to why people drop out and what happens to them afterwards. And, and people know that, but they don't want to do anything about it because it's easier to just say, those people failed, let's just go along pushing the people who inverted commas succeeded, i.e. those that confirm to the system yeah. and jump the hurdles according to the way the hurdles were set out by the people who set out the course. So, yeah. yeah, I think that, that if, if you want to have a system which is not going to do that, you either have to have mavericks, and I think that several people around the room here you know, who have long careers are clearly mavericks, uh, or you have to have something where people's remuneration is not directly related to profit making for an organization or revenue generating for an organization, and, and you need to detach the two things. Mm -hmm. But that's not the direction we're going in as well. We're going in the opposite direction. No, and you mentioned the, the employment sector is the, um, the advent of zero hours contracts for people in, in work uh, can lead to almost impossible situations for low income workers because they, they use various algorithms to determine what the customer load is going to be at any given time. So they might expect somebody to be in for two hours and then, you know, lay them off for two hours and expect them to be in for one hour. And then maybe there's a snow day or something, so they say to most of the staff, don't come in. Or alternatively, uh, there's, a, there's a big rush and people are supposed to come in whether or not they have anything else planned. Uh, these zero, zero hours on demand contracts for people, particularly in the retail and service industries, make it almost impossible for them to do things like schedule going to school. You know, community college is supposed to be an option for improving oneself. I guess here it's the higher education institutions. But if you don't have a regular schedule and if you don't have anything approaching a regular income, it makes that very difficult. Because you're, you're looking at a situation where the individual human beings have been treated like machines. And of course, if they're treated like machines, the possibility is that they'll break down uh, or that the situation will break down. And that, that reminds me of another old story of Walter Ruther, used to be the head of the United Auto Workers. And some of, the, uh, some of the owners were showing him around the robotics uh, factory that they were setting up. And it's like, you know, look at these machines. You know, they don't take sick days, they don't take vacations, they don't take <coughs> raises. And Ruther said, yeah, and they don't buy cars either. So if you want to have a consumer economy, there's an extent to which what happens is that you have to pay the consumers enough to afford the things that you want to sell to them. And if you have a situation like Walmart, which pays its people such low salaries that they are being sub subsidized by the government in terms of food banks and you know income top-ups of one sort or another, then essentially what you have is the government, the taxpayers, 
supporting these businesses, making big profits out of paying their workers the minimum amount possible. And that also is a reputation, you know, that, that they think is great. You know, they're saving money, they're enhancing shareholder values, what have you, and they're cutting the stability out from under the society. You, you would think, by the way, that conservatives, quote unquote, would be in favor of social stability, but it seems that that's been lost. Well, we have a big society in Britain, so we solve them all the time. You see, I thought it was a collection of individuals that were seeking to maximize their personal benefit. I think there's a, there's a challenge with this as well, the way we talk about this, and, and Dennis, I think, said earlier on about doing the wrong thing better. Um, what, we, what we don't seem to be able to do is hit the second feedback loop. Uh, I'm sorry to keep banging on it, Ashby, but the, 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 this notion of where the essential variables sit and how we do it, because what we seem to do, what we're prone to doing, is taking operational and narrow performance data because it's easy. We lock this person up for 10 years. This car does 40 miles to the gallon, etc. This very hard, cleaner, faster, cheaper, efficiency type stuff. And we're not managing to bring into the equation the, the second loop where it, where it goes through purpose. Mm -hmm. What we're actually trying to define, what we're trying to achieve as an outcome rather than as a result. Uh, and until we can bring that into the, the discussion, we, we've got a problem. And I think that extends into the urbanisation stuff when we talk about the big data and the use of, uh, of uh, the extension of the, new, the nervous system for whatever, if we can get a grip on this, you want to read the last chapter in Understanding Media, right? Marshall mm -hmm. McLuhan yeah. has an absolutely blinding critique about that yeah. and about the extent to which we've now externalised our... We, we've grown to mistrust our own nervous system so much that we've externalised it uh, as an extension of human power. But um, McLuhan's... McLuhan's critique is not positive in, in terms of that. So you, we, we need to, in much the same way as we talk about widening the discussion, we need, to, we need to widen our discussion, we need to make our meta discussion that much bigger because the, and to finish off, I, I guess, the other one is these kind of systems, even if we get the second loop in, are only going to satisfy the demands of the essential variables. They're going to keep bouncing the behavior yeah. till it finds a state that can be stable, which means that whether or not people fit into society is going to be a function of the, decide, the society we represent on our essential variables. So we have to be able to open that up. So there's a whole critical theoretical debate that sits around what our essential variables should be so that we can appropriately target our second feedback. But I think there are, some, there are some real challenges in there, but they're not just cybernetic and they're not just social. There's, the McLuhan media theory is, is a blinding case of it that we can yeah, use. Yeah, but the media is the case, and all of the things that we're going to be looking at with climate change also mm -hmm. are going to require an awful lot of, of readjustment and a question of uh, widening the boundaries about what, what we want to see covered. Mm -hmm. Because we've had a long history of downloading the risk and uploading the benefits, and in particular of downloading the risk to people who are not not capable of handling it very well. Uh, maybe because they're in a, a city or a region that has low, uh, high unemployment. Maybe they're in an area where they're downwind or downriver from, from stuff. Uh, we have some Aboriginal communities in Canada where the birth rate is two-thirds female. Mm -hmm. Uh, that isn't natural, and they are they are trying to figure out, you know, who they can hold accountable for this and how they can fix it, other than simply moving everybody somewhere else. But there's so many so many areas where the problems get more complex, and the solutions seem to get more narrow and more simple. And that mismatch is, is going to cause a real problem. And part of the part of the system's approach is looking for where the feedback loops are, looking for who gets rewarded for what and what position they have in, in society, and thinking about whether or not that's actually what we want to see, or whether 
we aren't actually, you know, saving money by limiting this, but then causing many more problems down the line. And I think uh, Harold Lindstone is somebody who talked about discounting improvements to uh, uh, environmental uh, problems. So that if you install a, uh, a more efficient set of machinery, that the investment that you've made in that has to be able to be paid off rather quickly because if it has to be paid off in 10 years, the discounted, uh, the way they discount ends up making that investment worth zero. Uh, there's also some, some work on alternative currencies, which could see, conceivably be a buffer against some of the fluctuations where, you know, somebody in Greece is having a hard time because of what somebody in China decided. So what's the positive news? Pardon? What's the positive news? What the positive news is? Um, people are becoming a lot more aware of these things. People are certainly, uh, there's going to be a big, was a big march in London in a couple of weeks on the environment issue. Uh, many people have been talking about this conference on the environment in Paris as essentially a peace conference because Many people are saying that <coughs> the effects of climate change are probably the biggest national security threat that any of the Western countries face. Um, but when you yeah. say many people, these people are not always the key people within the system. No. So. <laughs> no, but they're, particularly with the internet, they are people who have a, an audience. They are people who are getting the word out. And that, that's another kind of a question. It, interestingly, we, in Canada, we don't get uh, Fox News approved to be on our cable channels because they say it, you know, it can't be considered news because they lie so much, which is kind of, is kind of interesting. But, Many people will, walk, will just look at the media that reinforces their own worldview. And that, in a way, is, is unfortunate because not only do you not need your own worldview reinforced, but it's also probably a good idea to, to think about what the other folks are, are thinking. And also to remember that most of the other folks that we think of as our opponents think that they're doing something positive. However short-sighted or backwards that might be, you know, they aren't going out every day and saying, I'm going to do evil. Even what, when we look at it and we say, you know, we think it's evil, but they think that they are doing whatever they're doing for a greater good. So how do you, uh, you know, how do you get under that? And that only can happen by people broadening their perspectives so that they understand that there are such things as legitimate grievances that, if they're unaddressed, fester. Uh, there are such such things as opportunities that, if, that if they're not made more widely available, again, will have a real um, a real destabilizing effect. And one of the one of the other aspects that, that Stafford addressed was in a paper called "The Future of Work." And they'd done a study in Canada a couple of years before that, basically saying that you could give people a citizen's income and it would be revenue neutral. That is, that you wouldn't, it wouldn't cost that much more to do this than to have all of the bureaucracy around deciding who was eligible for what and under what circumstances. And that if we had a citizen's income, which was, which would guarantee that people would not starve, that a lot of the, um, a lot of the negative uh, reverberations would, would be damped considerably if not eliminated. That's Green Party policy in the UK. Mm -hmm. yeah. Green Party advocate. Okay. And that's been for 40 years, I should say. Mm -hmm. I wrote the, the first one. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> the issue with that, of course, is that, again, coming back to ritualistic behavior, that the whole point of signing on in the UK is a ritual and it, it creates uh, a norm 
or ab ab abnormality, if you like. So, and, and the right wing press backs this up. Yeah. That, that you know the signing on is a ritual, you know, and and the citizens, which I, I actually agree with, the citizens' income would actually do away with all that. Yeah. And all that bureaucracy, but then you wouldn't have a ritual that would that would create people in a, an abnormal position mm -hmm. in society. Well, I guess it, it's useful to come and say, who, who benefits from putting these people in an abnormal position? Or who benefits from uh, the religious perspective that's, that says if people are poor or ill, that it's their own fault somehow, and, or that God is punishing them for past sins? You know, it's a, it's a good way of justifying not to trouble yourself about anybody else's ill fortune. And it's not unusual, though, is it, that this notion of signing on goes right the way back to the poor law and, and the extent to which any relief had to be less than the value that was required. The, the, the intention being that, that there would be an imperative to get out and not be, and to be self-sufficient in inverted commas. Um, so, it, you know, I, I have a problem with the stuff that Elena alluded to earlier, this idea that we put lots of things in place in order to support people who are being paid an illegitimate wage, which effectively just reinforces the ability to pay illegitimate wages. It's subsidising large corporations that do make money at the expense of everybody. Mm. And I think there's a challenge in that, and I think there's a, there's a challenge somewhere with the citizen's wage in, in the same situation. It'd be relatively easy to, to then import a, a complete boatload of very low wage employers because the government can pick up the bill. Well, I think that the idea was of the citizens' wage was not that people wouldn't have any incentive to do more. <coughs> it was more that there would be a floor, not that there would be a ceiling. No, 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 no except that. I'm, I'm not talking about the people not wanting to get on. Yeah. I'm talking about the employers moving in to buy people at much cheaper prices and therefore the large the larger employers or the higher wage employers may or may not move, but we'd certainly, given the free flow of capital, allow for people moving in that wanted to pay whatever they wanted to pay, and the bill being picked up by the by the citizens' wage. Well, would people would people really be interested in working for someone who was not going to pay them much well, more they are now, aren't they? the same as they were getting on a citizens' Walmart, wage? Walmart, but you, you said yourself, Walmart brag about being able to do it. Oh yes, but there's no citizen's wage. Yeah, all I'm saying is that the citizen's wage would, re would reinforce it. Mm, I think that, that would be something that should be investigated. Mm -hmm. Down here. There was a question over here about leadership. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a debate going on within IEEE about what kind of leadership is needed. I don't know whether you've been part of that. Uh, David, have you been, you been part of it, I think? Um, not exactly. I, I moved the question a different direction, so I have, I have not been involved in the direction they've been taking. Okay. okay. Uh, Elena, you've not been part of it? No. Yeah, well. <laughs> no, I think, you know, us folks that are past presidents, um, aren't necessarily in all those loops, discussion loops that is. Do you know more about it, Jennifer? Well, I didn't hear the question all the way, Dennis. Well, it's this thing about what exactly constitutes leadership. It's a build up to the, uh, the conference in, in Denver. And I think it's originally uh, Kahneman who's put it forward. But it's, there's various other people have tuned in. Uh, it's the concept of leadership in sustainability. Yeah, and, and, and I so said it's it not just nice. about leadership itself, it, uh, or what leadership is. It's it's in that context, because there are a whole gamut of um, particular perspectives about what leadership, whether it's from behind or whether it's from in front, when it comes to sustainability, um, d um, the practice of sustainability. Yeah, but I think it has more wider implications uh, as to what constitutes leadership. 
It does, but that's what that conversation was about. It is primarily about that, true. But the, uh, I've just requested there should be simpler language, and that's also resulted in a 